Hello everyone and welcome back to the Sedona International Film Festival. I'm your host Carol Kahn and we'd like to thank Sedona Rouge Hotel where we're coming to you live as one of our sponsors along with Broadcast Rentals and Sedona Advertising Agency. Thank you all for being part of the Sedona Film Festival. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you to a Grammy, an Emmy, and a Tony Award winner. And a seven-time Oscar loser. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yes. I know, but you've been nominated seven times for the Academy Award, and it is it's such a great pleasure to have you here. Hi. <laughs> Mark Shaman. Hi. Hello. <laughs> well, this is your first time in Sedona, I understand? Yes. Um, and I've had this trouble with my knee, like, for over a year. When I walk up and down steps, I realize, oh, I'm getting old. It's something this bad. And I got here last night, and it went away. So is it the vortex? Mm -hmm. Sedona is magical. It's magical. It's completely it's, gone away. Yeah, it's magical and mystical. So you need to stay here. That's the whole thing. Oh, God, that <laughs> picture, that large face. Oh, is that going to be here the whole time? <laughs> Hello. I think you're cute. So nice Come to on. talk to you. <laughs> Well, and you're here um, because you're going to be playing tomorrow evening, correct, at the Sedona Performing Arts Center. Yes, that is true. And also, you're going to give an award to Rob Reiner, who's also going to be here on Saturday evening. Yes, you're doing all this off book. I is know. There, is there a little person talking no. to you in your ear? Very <laughs> no. impressive. No, I have to do my homework. <laughs> and I have to remember everything. See, I can't remember hashtags, <laughs> but <laughs> I can remember information about you, so that's good. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your career because the last film that um, that was up for an award was Mary Poppins and Returns. Mary Poppins Returns, correct? And you do the you composed the music for it. Two jobs. Yes. Um, co-wrote the songs with my co-lyricist Scott Whitman. So I wrote the music and co-wrote the lyrics to the songs, and then also scored the movie. You know, the underscore in the film, which is something I've been doing since <laughs> nineteen. 90? <laughs> Which is why my knee hurts so much. <laughs> um, so this was nice to have a movie where I got to be both a songwriter and writing the score. Two, two very different kind of jobs. Uh, and it was a, a dream of a lifetime. And, and this is not your first time. I mean, you, you have a laundry list of films and Broadway and musicals and all of that that you've been part of. Yeah, which is amazing. not the first time. Maybe the last. No. <laughs> no, please. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> how did this all come to be? Like, how did you, at one particular point, um, how young were you when you first started playing piano? Oh, I was, you know, embryonic, I yeah. think. <laughs> My mother only recently told me that um, it's like a, a little scene out of a movie where my sister was taking a piano lesson and then went out to play, and my mother said to the piano teacher, Miss Andrews, said, come on up and have a cup of coffee. <laughs> so they were upstairs in the kitchen, and they heard my sister's piano lesson being played. But they knew they had heard my sister go outside. So they looked downstairs, and <laughs> I was there figuring it out by ear. I, I, I don't remember that. Um, I don't remember anything <laughs> anymore. But um, so it was just like that. If there hadn't been a piano in the house, I don't know what would have happened. My family, my parents weren't very into music. There wasn't like music playing all the time at all, really. Um, but it was just in me. And then by the time I hit like 13 and got exposed to community theater in and around like, the town I lived in and started playing for musicals one after another, I just became obsessed with musical theater. And well, actually the Mary Poppins soundtrack was what I f my first obsession and continues to be my greatest obsession. I, I listen to that album and I'm looking down there because I'm picturing that turntable that I would put the album on and just listen to constantly. And, uh, and then, so yeah, so doing community theater, I was exposed to the real guts of, of how songs are written and orchest orchestrated because when you do a show, you get the music you know, where it really says, it's not just like the music you buy at a music sheet store. Uh, you know, it really shows you, this is what the trombones are doing, the flutes, and you can look and, and so I, that was my schooling, those books. And by the time I was 16, 
also obsessed with Bette Midler at that point. Bette Midler had become a star around the time I was 13 or 14 with Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. I would sit by the radio and just wait for it to come on as I was turning on and off the Mary Poppins soundtrack. <laughs> so there I was. And I'll cut to the, the great end of the story is that last year, Bette Midler, my now very good friend, sang our song for Mary Poppins Returns at the Academy. Now I'm going to cry. So, uh, so there's quite a, you know, ending to that, those two obsessions as, as, a, as a child and as a teenager. Isn't it interesting how things like come full circle a lot with a passion that you like have? Like my stomach, <laughs> my face. Oh, jeez. Yeah. No, that's not what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have had more full circle moments than Oprah Winfrey could ever wish for. It is true. I, it is amazing. I mean, I, I like writing Hairspray, a musical, and then getting to go both my junior high school and my high school, put it on, you know, years later. And I got to go and actually go to the actual auditoriums that I had sat at the piano, thinking someday I'll write a Broadway musical. And I got to actually see them performing the Broadway musical I wrote with someone actually playing those very same pianos that I had played. I mean, it doesn't get more full circle than that. I know, it's, am it's amazing. When was your big break, though, in your career? I, I was really actually lucky from the moment I stepped into New York when I was 16, and I kept meeting the right people and all that. I was obsessed with Bette Midler and the first friends I made, and I stayed with them on the weekends when I played for their comedy review. They lived across the hall from one of Bette Midler's backup singers. So one could say that was my first big break, and it's when people say, well, how can I do what you did? How can I follow in your footsteps? I say, you have to meet some people one day who have a comedy review and they happen to live across the <laughs> hall from the backup singer of the woman you're obsessed with who's the greatest performer of a generation. So I became their musical director. Her backup girls decided to do their own act. And there I was. I was 16, maybe 17 at that point. Knew the kind of harmony they wanted to do from my obsession with Bette Midler records and would work for free or next to nothing. And there I was right next door. It was also convenient. So. Uh, I got to work with them, uh, and then Bette Midler said to the girls, come on uh, back with me, and I'll let you open my show. And so before I was even 18, this dream came true of being on the road with Bette Midler, living with her at her house because she was, well, she's frugal. And, and when she discovered there was this you know, kid who could play all her songs, she said, stay in town, but I'm not going to put you in a hotel. I stayed in her guest room at her house. So suddenly I'm like, you know, eating breakfast across from Bette Midler every morning, whereas just like two years earlier, I was putting posters of her on the wall and, and you know, stealing money from my father's wallet to go to New York City and see her in concert. Um, and then uh, I worked at Saturday Night Live for a while and met Billy Crystal. And Billy Crystal led me to Rob Reiner. <laughs> it's all up here. And Martin Short was there too. And then... Uh, Rob Reiner just started having me score all his movies. Why he trusted that I would have all that mus movie music, underscoring kind of music in me was beyond belief, but he, he sensed something in me and he kept giving me jobs. Misery was the first movie. Well, When Harry Met Sally. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that all you need to do is ask me one question and I won't stop talking? <laughs> this I've, I've run out of film. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Billy Crystal led to When Harry Met Sally and Rob Reiner and then Bette Midler's Beaches and so those were big breaks and then I scored movies for 10 years non-stop. South Park, Bigger, Longer and Uncut was a movie I, I co-wrote the songs and or orchestrated and scored. And luckily from that, people kept telling this woman named Margot Lyon who had the idea of making a musical of Hairspray for Broadway. That movie came out just as she was looking for someone who had a kind of cockeyed sense of humor. And people just kept saying to her, oh, you should get Mark Shaman. He went off to Hollywood, but he'd be perfect. So there, then that was the ultimate dream. Opening night of Hairspray on Broadway. That was it. That was <laughs> it. The hero's journey. Yeah. I think you've gone around the hero's journey. This, so, okay, so you were, this isn't a loss, but I mean, I know you didn't win yet, but so how could we get you to win the Academy Award <laughs> coming up for 2020? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I really thought I stood a chance with Mary Poppins Returns with the score. I knew for song we were up against Lady Gaga. 
and if you don't mind my saying so, I knew that they were going to shove that Oscar so far up Lady Gaga's ass that when she smiled, it would look like a filling. But uh, I thought maybe I could get the score, but didn't get it. So I don't know. I'm happy to have been nominated. What? Did I say something wrong? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I think I've just fallen in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, I know you have a performance tomorrow evening at 7.15. Yes. Do you know? Do you know where it is? I do. It's They're going to the drive me there. I don't know where. Uh, yeah. I'm going to drive you there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll pick you up, okay? Yeah. <laughs> All right, at the Sedona Performing Arts Center. Yes. It'll just be more of this. Just <laughs> me endlessly <laughs> vomiting out stories. And I luckily have a few singers coming mm -hmm. and uh, one of them, Megan Hilty, who co-starred on Smash, which I wrote songs for, and she's brilliant. And um, it should be a fun night. Well, I cannot wait. I am a big fan of, I love piano music. It's probably the only thing I ever listened to. So, and I love your work and thank you so much. And I'm gonna be your biggest cheerleader, pom-poms and all, just cheering you on because I do wanna see you in 2021 at the Academy Awards and being nominated. So whoever is out there, this has to happen, okay? It has to happen this year. It's eight, right? <laughs> Famous eight. <laughs> It means infinity, so, okay, all, all right. right, it's good. Well, Mark, thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome, thank you. All right, and if you're out there on social media, don't forget hashtag Sedona Film Fest 2020 and hashtag Sedona Film Fest 26. We'll be back with more right after this.